Hello, Mary Richards. It's great to be with you today. Hello, Lizzie Lassiter, and likewise. And all of you who are listening along with us, welcome to Somatic Self-Care. We're continuing our series on the book, The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk. If you're reading along with us, which is not required, um, we're going to focus on part one today, which are chapters one, two, and three. And part one is called The Rediscovery of Trauma. There's a quote on page, my page 31, I'm on a paper book. Uh, it's from the section called Making Sense of Suffering in chapter two. Um, he writes, the way medicine approaches human suffering has always been determined by the technology available at any given time. What, what, what does that prickle in you, Mary, to think about? Well, of course, I think back to leeches and, you know, uh, driving out dark humors and, and things like that, the things that used to be done back in the day that were considered, you know, medically sound practices. <laughs> and what I enjoy most about that quote uh, is how it highlights the, adva the, the advances in neuroscience, psychology, immunology, et cetera, especially advances in imaging, in functional you know, MRI for brain imaging, how it validates the ancient wisdom of practices like yoga. Yeah. And just to summarize, what, what would you say are the, is the ancient wisdom of practices like yoga in this context of somatic self-care, trauma, body healing? Well, so what we've learned thanks to advances in med medical technology in particular is that mindfulness-based practices like gentle asana, restorative yoga, pranayama and the like, they actually facilitate brain growth in the regions of the brain responsible for our sensory perception, processing and integration and they help us identify how we're feeling, why we're feeling it. And as a result, we develop abilities in our own self-regulation. Talk to us about the amygdala. In chapter two, Bessel writes a lot about the amygdala in, in the section, Soothing the Brain. He says, the amygdala is a cluster of brain cells that determines whether a sound image or body sensation is perceived as a threat. Mm -hmm. And that the sensitivity of the amygdala depends in part on the amount of the neurotransmitter serotonin in that part of the brain. Yeah, right. Okay, so, you know, we have, a, we have different brains, okay? <laughs> we have a thinking brain which we, those are your cortical structures. They're more, they're closer to the skull, all right? And then we have our emotional brain. The amygdala is a part of that emotional brain. It's called the limbic system. And then we have our reptilian brain, which is this ancient brainstem type of uh, system that is responsible for sort of our base survival. Okay, we spend most of our time in our emotional brain, believe it or not. <laughs> and yeah, 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 yeah. Because see everything from coming from our bodies, all the, all the feelings, the sense, the sensory inputs that we perceive that are, that are being registered by the body, they go up to this uh, uh, processing sort of grand central station in the, in the limbic system uh, 
called the thalamus. Your thalamus is right there. Your thalamus is like this big switch, big railroad switching network. And it's sending all this information to different regions of your brain to make decisions about how we want to act, how we want to respond to stimuli. And so most of our responses, our body, body patterning, et cetera, are related to our perception of threat and safety. And that's not something that's consciously determined. It's something that our amygdala in tandem with our uh, various other brain structures like the hippocampus uh, are constantly evaluating. Mm. Okay, and then on top of that, we have, we have this like, Bessel van der Kolk refers to it as the watchtower, which is the, um, it's this median prefrontal cortex structure and it's determining the intensity of our responses. So you see this belief that we're somehow logical is really just something we like to tell ourselves because, and because emotions aren't inherently bad or illogical. In fact, emotions are the most logical thing ever because they are, they are an expression of our lived experience. It's what we're experiencing right here, right now. The problem is say the amygdala, it gets stimulated. We have some perception of threat or strain, and then it sets off a whole cascade of physiologic responses that may or may not match up with the present reality. Because if there's been some sort of trauma that will reset our physiology in such a way that we may stay in a, a state of upregulation. And the amygdala are really, they're just like the button pushers in a way, you know, they're just waiting to have their, their switches flipped. Right, right. I love getting more fluent in real time about my emotional experience because it helps me make better decisions. Like I say what I mean more quickly than, than having the experience of, of saying yes and then later rethinking and realizing I was feeling no, but I said yes. And then I have to awkwardly circle back and cancel something or like... It, instead of just in real time when someone presents an option and my belly says no, and then I just say, no, thank you. <laughs> like, <laughs> that means you've got a good watchtower. You know, you're learning to live in the present. And this is the key, of course, to satisfied living is to be here now. I want to recommend a book to everyone by Brene Brown, Atlas of the Heart, has been revolutionary, rev has been a revolution for me in my vocabulary of feeling. I thought I was pretty, you know, I'm from California. So I thought like I feel my feelings, but this book has helped me name my feelings in a very powerful way in terms of being in communication, like number one with my partner, for example, just like saying, I'm feeling this and the, the precision of saying I'm feeling sad or I'm feeling heartbroken. It feels different. And I'm enjoying sort of digging through that book and on, on like a feeling hunt. What am I, what am I feeling right now? Yeah, this is so important because uh, most of us, and I include myself in this, is we, um, we have a more tenuous relationship with our feelings. A lot of us are unable to name with specificity how we're feeling. And so this is where practices like restorative yoga and gentle asana can be very helpful is because we can use the body, which is so available to us as a tangible entity. You know, we can see it, we can touch it, we're aware of it, et cetera. We can use the body as a gateway to develop our emotional fluency as we develop fluency about, you know, sensations where we're feeling pressure, hot, cold, 
constrained, hollow, et cetera. Yeah, and I, I feel like the body is accessible in a way that the mind sometimes isn't. And someone called me in distress a couple of weeks ago before a law school exam and she was crying. And I knew she only had a few minutes before the test. And I, I just said, like, do something with your body. You've got to like go for a walk, breathe, do some sun salutations, like do something to shift. So you can't ruminate and figure out this, pro like you can't think your way out of this right now. You've got to just like move your body and get, get in your breath. That's the only tangible way I often feel for myself as well of like, that's like a, a lever or, a, or a, a button that I can push. Would you agree, Mary? Absolutely. And the science backs us up in this opinion, Lizzie, because the brain not only is a wonderful, wonderful organ and system for storing information and memories and, and learning and coordination and you know, motor patterning, et cetera. But the brain is also a wolf in sheep's clothing. It will hide stuff from us. Yeah, yeah. I wanna to go to chapter two, the section adaptation or disease. And Bessel writes about four fundamental truths um, that the brain disease model overlooks. Would you just briefly explain before I read the quote, what, what is the brain disease model? Well, you know, if we think about how we've approached in particular mental health and well-being, we've taken a very mechanistic view. Oh, you're deficient in, you know, you're leaking too much serotonin. You're not holding on to enough serotonin. You um, uh, have ADHD or uh, there, you know, we, we label things, right? We try to break things down into brain functions that aren't working, that are in some way, shape or form engaged in a disease process. And what a disease model, a sort of, a disease model does is it, it, it disassociates us from our actual human reality as interconnected beings. Because it says, oh, well, you're having these problems because they're your problems. But see, a lot of our, a lot of our distress, our emotional pain and suffering arises because our social connections have been disrupted in such a way that we no longer feel safe with other people and we no longer feel safe within ourselves. Mm. I just want to side note for everyone listening, like I asked Mary that question out of the blue. She did not prepare for that. That is why I love working with you, Mary. Like I asked you, what is the brain disease model? And you gave like an eloquent ready to publish, <laughs> delightful, insightful answer. All right, I'm reading now uh, from that section, adaptation or disease. So I, I really love these four fundamental truths that Bessel highlights, and I, they, they feel optimistic for me. So he's saying that these are four truths that the brain disease model overlooks. And in some ways, I think these relate, or in, in many ways, these relate to our somatic self-care work. So the first one is, our capacity to destroy one another is matched by our capacity to heal one another. Restoring relationships and community is central to restoring well being. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Number two, language gives us the power to change ourselves and others by communicating our experiences, helping us to define what we know, and finding a common sense of meaning. Number three, we have the ability to regulate our own physiology, including some of the so-called involuntary functions of the body and brain through such basic activities as breathing, moving, and touching. And number four, finally, we can change social conditions to create environments in which children and adults can feel safe and where they can thrive. This feels like th these four points to me feel like a manifesto. In my 
in my mind, Lizzie, they are uh, rules to live by. This is how I believe we're meant to organize ourselves within ourselves and with one another. And, you know, I used to believe that I had to solve all my problems. You know, it was my responsibility to fix things. Part of that was my upbringing. And what I've really enjoyed as an adult and especially as a, a parent is asking for help. I never realized until I was outnumbered by children, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that asking for help was actually an act of love. Mm. Yeah. And I, I think about your remark earlier about Brene Brown's wonderful work, uh, Atlas of the Heart. Uh, and here, uh, Dr. Vanderkolk states this, you know, language gives us power to change ourselves and others by communicating our experience, et cetera. See, this is why it's so important that we become somat somatically fluent, it, fluent in our sensory language, fluent in our emotional language, because we are so much more than, you know, sad, glad, scared, and mad, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And we're much more than afraid or relaxed. We, we have, we, we don't live in primary colors. Yeah. The, the third chapter in this section, what does he call them? He calls them parts. So the third chapter in part one, which we're covering today is we could kind of say decide, says that all trauma is pre-verbal or 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 discusses that can you pick that apart for us a little bit mary richards what is what does it mean to say that all trauma is pre-verbal okay so meaning that it's not pre-verbal and that trauma only happens before we learn to talk it's that trauma happens on a level before language. Okay, so what is the, when we're born, okay, let's go back to ourselves at birth. You know, we are just a mat, a little bundle of hunger, wet diapers, <laughs> and sleepiness, right? That's, that's what we're doing. We're just a sensory ball of experience. And, uh, we first begin expressing cues for hunger, discomfort, et cetera. So right out the gate, we interact with the world bodily. Language doesn't come until we are a couple of years old. And so what happens is when we experience a traumatic event, it interrupts our, our brain function, okay? So we have a right and left hemisphere of the brain, okay? We have two halves of the brain and they, they speak their own languages, okay? So the left side, we usually associate, you know, with logic, analytics, um, you know, abstract languages like math, uh, sequential organization and language, okay? The right side is intuition, emotions, uh, visual, spatial, tactile processing, okay? So the left side does the talking and the right side does the communicating through facial expressions, body movements, etc. Are you with me? Yes. Okay. So the first thing that to develop is, you know, kids 
kids uh, are, 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 are body-based. They're right hemispheric, you know, when they're little babies. And then, uh, then they become, our left hemisphere comes online when we start to understand language and learning to speak, when we can start to name things and, and understand uh, inner, inner relations and communicate with others. And what happens then is the right side of the brain stores our memories and the emotions they evoke. And, and the right side reacts to others. And especially it holds memories of how people have treated us in the past and our strategies for successfully interacting with those other people. So trauma interrupts interrupts the exchange of information between the hemispheres. So if you're so terrified, okay, you, you've been, you're, you're terrified because you're under threat, your, your physical safety, your emotional safety, you don't have to be physically terrified or physically harmed to be traumatized. But just we get to a place where physically, emotionally, we are immobilized in some way, we can't form the words to describe it or talk about it because we've gone into a, 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 deeper, a deeper state of being that's a lot more primordial and primitive. Yeah. We go into brain structures that come before language. And that's why a lot of people have difficulty talking about things and also may have difficulty remembering details because they're the integrative sharing between the right and less left hemispheres of the brain has been interrupted. Mm. You know, it's funny, my two and a half year old twin boys, like they say, they have this phrase that they, as language is coming online for them, they mm -hmm. say, I sick. Mm -hmm. And I sick means either I'm going to vomit in the next 30 seconds. So like, please be prepared to receive my vomit or like, I'm, well, I want to create friction to doing the next thing that mama wants me to do, like getting in the bathtub, you know, it's like, and it's, it's such a funny thing because it's like this one phrase is either for me, like, you know, four alarm fire or like, Hey, come on, buddy, let's go pop, pop take off your diaper, jump in the bathtub. So it's, it's, it's funny because it also, you know, they, they are, I can see them becoming more differentiated and being able to explain what they're feeling in real time to me, or, you know, even just from a, it's like, they just literally don't have the words yet. And what I love hearing you say is that even as grownups, when we technically have the words in the vocabulary sense, uh, because of the way our brain is structured, we're sometimes not able to sort of grasp them or 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 implement them. Is is that what you're saying? Yeah, you know, we start out very right brain dominant, if you will, and then as we as we begin to acquire language and, and undergo the psychological differentiation of that comes with walking and running and talking, you know, we no longer have to be toted around by our parents. Uh, we're developing more autonomy. The left side of the brain, you know, begins to really develop. And, and what we want, of course, is we want a really well-developed corpus callosum, the super highway linking the hemispheres of the brain so that we can you know, switch and, and play both sides. That's exactly what I wanted to ask as my last question, as we move to close for today, what are the somatic self-care practices that you do, or you recommend we do for linking the left and right hemisphere? How can we integrate better there? Uh, well, movement is fantastic. 
you know, asana is fantastic, especially um, asana with breath awareness. Because we're uh, able, the, each asana, I think of asana as a question that we're asking ourselves. It's not just how am I forming warrior two, but how, how do I feel in the pose? And how is my body speaking to me in my pose? And how is my brain responding to my body? What's my, and what self-talk arises? So asana is great for, for bringing the brain and the body together, okay? But also uh, the ability to be still. So restorative yoga and yoga nidra because combining stillness with the journey offered by yoga nidra, yoga, yogic sleep is a great way, I believe, and you know, there's data to back this up, uh, to increase our uh, awareness and ability to articulate how we're feeling. Because these practices ask us to saturate ourselves with feeling. Mm, this interoception piece. Yes, yes. And so like with children, it's so important that we play with them. Of course, play, play, play is huge. You know, I have built so many Thomas the Tank Engine setups and puzzles and built Rube Goldberg devices and all of that. Play is incredibly important for facilitating not just a child's linguistic development and, and interpersonal biology, but it's imperative that we keep playing through adulthood because this is how we become more, become more emotionally aware and fluent. It's why, you know, if you like to sing, you know, join a choir. Or, you know, if you like to run, um, connect with a running group. We want, we need to do things that connect us to other people through joyful activities, through things that we enjoy, so that we uh, not only live a more satisfying life when we're having fun, but also so that we can live a more satisfying life when we're not having fun. <laughs> I could definitely do a better job of that with play. I'm always like with my kids, just like, just don't make a mess. <laughs> just don't make a mess. <laughs> <laughs> Mary, it's such a delight to spend time with you and bask in your intelligent, warm glow. Anything else that we need, that you need to say or share with us about part one of The Body Keeps the Score before we close? Well, I would like to just encourage folks, you know, just just read it gently. You don't have to get all caught up, you know, in limbic systems and terms like loss of executive functioning and stuff like that. What I think is most important to consider is the incredible uh, enmeshment of our bodies and our minds. Mm. so good tell everyone where they can find you on the internet mary folks can find me at yoga with mary richards.com that's my website it's also my handle on i guess meta now instagram and uh soon i'll have a substack newsletter yes 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 and i hope you're all subscribed to my newsletter which you can find at lizzie l-i-z-z-i-e dot yoga Mary and I are here as optimistic, enthusiastic cheerleaders for simple ways that you can take better care of your sweet self. We believe in you. 
And we love you. Love you, Mary Richards. Thank you so much. I love you too, Lizzie. Thank you.